There were 5.5 million new campers in 2023, and it's over four times harder to find a campsite than it was back in 2019. But there's good news. It's getting better. On this episode of the podcast, Kevin Long from The Dirt joins us to talk about their annual camping report. Plus, we have some travel day hacks from the RV Miles community. This is RV Miles. Since 1912, L.L. Bean has been helping people get outside together with gear tips and advice for exploring all the possibilities of the outdoors all year long. Here's a quick tip for your next ski, snowboard, snowshoe, or sledding trip. Change into your socks and base layers when you get to the mountain or trailhead, not before. A toasty car ride is a great way to ease into the day, but it might introduce moisture that could make you cold later. Start dry and warm so you'll stay dry and warm. For more tips, easy how-tos, and inspiring stories, visit llbean.com slash explore. Welcome to episode number 308 of RV Miles. I'm Jason. And I'm Abby. And we are two RVers who, along with our three boys, have been crisscrossing North America on one epic road trip since 2016. Here at RV Miles, we talk all things RV and outdoors, from industry news to travel destinations, our national parks, and a whole lot more. We are gearing up to get out of here. We're hopping a flight tomorrow to head to Seattle for the Seattle RV Show. We hope to see you out there. We're going to have some great free seminars along with some other folks from the rv miles theater they're (laughs) naming the seminar space after us and uh we're going to be on some local tv in the morning on thursday and some other fun stuff but it'll be great to see so many of you uh have said already that we're going to get to see you out there so uh if you're coming uh please please do say hi we're going to be there all throughout the week We'll have a ton of seminars we can talk about, including how to plan an RV trip to a national park, which I think when you dive into this interview a little bit later is probably going to come up at least once because it is tough. I have been trying to book our trip for the summer and (laughs) it is February and I am looking at dates in August, y'all. And my, I just, last night I had to close the computer. I had to walk away from it because I was like, I can't do this anymore. This is really wild. That's so much of this national park space that I want to get into along the Southeast is booked, done, can't get into it. Yeah, we finally have sort of decided we're going to take the Ibex, um, which, which (laughs) for now, that'll probably change. (laughs) The idea being that that will help us a little bit in finding sites because it's shorter and everything and that we can do sort of short overnight boondocking. But it's also, you know, it's the summer in the South. It's going to be hot. So it's going to be so hot. And this wasn't, you know, as we've talked about, this wasn't necessarily the trip we thought we were taking this summer, but when a kid has a really great opportunity like Jack has with this film camp that he's going to we just we can't pass something like that up so we are trying to get into space that is highly coveted because there's not a lot of like national park campgrounds out in this section of the southeast that we're going to and the state parks themselves south carolina state parks north carolina state parks florida state parks they're very very popular even (laughs) when it is august in florida it is still incredibly difficult to get a campground so this is a new learning experience for us this is what we talked about about as we transition from a life of full-time RVing to a more deliberate and intentional RVing life because we only have so many weeks now that we can get out on the road. This is the first time, even through all and what you're going to talk about here in this interview, even through all of this and how busy it has been out there, we have always been able to just kind of go where the wind takes us. If this area of the country isn't working right now, well, you know what? We're going to go over here. Yeah. Or we used to get off in the summer times. We'd get off the road. We'd spend time with family. Well, now we need to be on the road in the summertime. And so this is a really, after eight years of being RVers, this is a huge change for us, a huge learning experience. And I know it's particularly hard in the East, which is why we're experiencing a lot of this. Most of the people in the country live in the East, so that can be 
a challenge. So we're definitely seeing what a lot of you have gone through over the years. <laughs> I would say that number that you gave of 5.5 million new RVers last year, my guess is 5.3 million of you live in the Northeast <laughs> because then you're all camping in one well, there, area of the country. There's some crazy stat about how like uh, there's a line th that sort of divides at like the plain states. Like so basically through like Kansas City and 80% of the humans in North America live on the eastern half of that line. I would believe that. Yeah, I would believe that just from what, you know, going out west and spending as much time as we have yeah. and how you, especially when you drive through something like Nevada. Yeah. And you just drive and drive and drive. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, I'm in Vegas. And then it's like, you just drive and drive and drive. Yeah. Absolutely. I can see that being true. Yeah. Yeah. So we wanted to uh, help alleviate some of your travel day problems. We're going to kick off the show here with some travel day hacks from folks around the RV Miles community. Yeah. So we asked this over on Facebook. I know, yes, Facebook still exists. Facebook is still there. We're showing our age a little bit. <laughs> well, we asked this over on Facebook. We asked it not only on the Facebook page that we have, but we also asked it in the RV Miles Facebook group. So if you're not over there, you should come over and help answer some of these questions. There's 13.5, I think 13,500 people in the group at this point. So it's a really robust and fun group. But we asked, what are some of your road trip secrets? What are some of your road trip hacks like that you perhaps think others don't know about that you would want to impart? And we got a ton of answers, I think like maybe 50 or 60 in total. And so I went through and picked out a few that I thought would be fun to talk about here. And we're just going to go through really quickly. We'll start with ours because we let it off. And yours was the gas is usually cheaper if you can't see the station from the highway. Yeah. True fact. The caveat to that. <laughs> Is that if it's not near the highway and you can see it, there's a huge possibility that that is not a big rig friendly station. Yeah. But if you uh, say you're, you know, camping at a campground and you're disconnecting your truck and you want to drive into one of these sites or, or if you've got a smaller motorhome or something like that, if you don't go to the fuel stations that are right there by the highway and maybe go a mile in, you you can definitely often save 10 percent or so. Get the Gas Buddy app. I know people always say to me when I recommend the Gas Buddy app, Gas Buddy wasn't accurate when I looked last time. Gas Buddy is, is entirely user dependent. So users submit the last fuel price they saw there. So it can change and you have to look at it and see when that price was submitted. But usually I found it's actually pretty accurate. Um, and I've been able to save a lot of money on fuel by just looking at an app and seeing, okay, the the one in town a little bit is cheaper or the one in the next town over is cheaper. Yeah, and of course you have to weigh your time against that too. Is it yeah. worth my time to go five, 10 minutes off of the highway on a travel day to save a buck fifty two dollars That's These are all things you have to weigh. But again, like Jay said, if you're out and about and you've got the RV back at the campground, just consider, you know, getting off that highway and checking out a gas station a little bit further in town, saving a little bit of money. All right. Jay says, and I completely agree with this, that road snack calories don't count after 55 miles per hour. Now I would argue road snack calories don't count the minute you get into the vehicle on your travel yeah. day. There are no calories on a travel day. But I think that was our problem <laughs> traveling like three days a week over the course of a year. Maybe <laughs> Maybe we we weren't maybe, counting too many calories. Yeah, maybe that maybe that's why a lot of our clothes aren't fitting currently. <laughs> but I do think on a travel day you are allowed to be calorie free if that's even something you care about. If that's even something you're paying attention to, just know that on a travel day you don't have to care about it. You don't have to pay attention to it. Uh, James says that you can set specific departure times in Google Maps to get a better sense of the impact traffic will have on your trip. This is a really great tip, and there's a lot of other apps that'll do this for you as well. You can find out like the best time of day to leave. You can get an idea of, okay, when I roll up into, especially if you're going to be traveling through a major city, yeah. this is so helpful. Yeah, because often you're looking at the route when you're laying in bed at 11 o'clock or something, your route for the next day, and it's giving you the information of what <laughs> traffic's like in the middle of the night. That's not very helpful, right? Not very helpful yeah. at all. <laughs> and I would, you know, this, I would add to this and I would say, really try to be mindful if you have to go through a big city of not getting into that big city anywhere really between like 7.30 and 9.30 in the morning and anywhere from like 
four to six in the afternoon yeah. because you're just you're gonna run into some form of rush hour traffic and that is really going to slow your travel day down speaking of maps did you know that this is the 100th anniversary of the road atlas no the, the ray and mcnally put out the first road atlas 100 years ago this year in april that would be a really cool piece of art to yeah. have oh, yeah. like the very yeah. first yeah. road atlas yeah. well, i'm gonna have to look into that okay kathleen says city parks with youth baseball complexes may have inexpensive hookups for a quick overnight stop i love this tip I think this is a really great one, especially if you find yourself traveling in the summer and perhaps something like a Walmart or a Harvest Host where you don't have any hookups is really not feasible for you if the temperatures throughout the night are going to stay incredibly high and very, very humid. We've talked a lot about this too from a city park perspective. I will always go back to the campground in Wisconsin. Yeah, well, that was actually at a, a, a baseball park as well. Yes. It was not a, not a youth baseball park, but it was at a minor league baseball park. Yeah, that was a really great city park that we landed in. It was just right outside of Minneapolis. River Falls, Wisconsin. River Falls, Wisconsin. Really, really inexpensive too. So if you find yourself wanting to do something where you do need hookups, this is a really, really great tip. I liked this one a lot. Uh, Steve says, stop at the state's welcome stations and get a paper map. They also have up-to-date information on road conditions and local knowledge. I love the idea too of talking to someone who's a little bit local, but... If you're going to find yourself in a state for a really, really long time, doing an extensive tour of, say, New Mexico or Colorado, grabbing that state's map yeah. can be a really nice way to check your routes. We're going to talk a little bit more about checking routes beyond GPS in a second, but just checking the route in that state and, and then talking to someone like about what the construction is looking like. It can be very helpful. Plus, you can get all the brochures. Oh, Jason loves the brochures. This man cannot walk into a space, be that a restaurant, a visitor center. If it is a if it is a touristy town and they have brochures. Yeah, I'm a sucker. Yeah, we had in the apartment, we had our like just sitting on our coffee table for the longest time. The most random brochures, I think it was just like one for a ski resort in New Mexico. And I can't remember what the other one was, but you happened to like find them as we were traveling yeah. back to lower 48 and you were like, or no, we were coming back from California Yeah, and you were like, oh, I got to have these brochures. Did yeah. you ever look at them? Yeah. The, the one was for, for Taos. I want to go there. The, it's supposed to be a very family friendly ski resort. Do you know what happened to those no, brochures? No, I think they probably got thrown away by they somebody. Probably, they might But have. you know, I think that dates back to like, my mom used to have me, if we were going to go on a vacation somewhere she would have me write to or call you could used to be a write to or call mm -hmm. the state visitors bureaus and then they would send you a packet of all kinds of information including like the map and everything lots of free coupons and yes and so i would i would do that and i loved pouring through that stuff and my grandparents like if my grandparents went on vacation they would always bring back brochures and maps like i remember the first time seeing uh, they brought the back maps of disney world back and oh, you know they went to epcot shortly after it opened and i got to see like one of the first epcot maps and i it was where are those <sighs> there I, my grandma has a bunch of stuff that i really hope didn't get thrown away oh that's incredible i really I, hope we should do a little investigating yeah. on that. You know, you can still actually do what you talked yeah. about by going to a visitor bureau's website. <laughs> they have these things called websites now. They it's a little they, easier. No, no, no. <laughs> they will send you stuff, though. Oh, okay. You can still go. If you, I like to have a physical yeah. item in front of me. It's I love to have a book in front of me. I, I tend to read books more when I'm holding the book than I do when they're on my Kindle, to be honest. And you can still go to these websites and you can still put in your address and they will send you their visitors, like their booklet. And you can pour through it and plan your trip. I think yeah. it's lovely. And a lot of a lot of states have a camping guide now, too, that has a, a list of all the campgrounds in the state, which is helpful. Yeah, I just I think that's really lovely. And it, 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 to me, it like it gets a sense of excitement when you're holding that thing and you're like, this is where I'm going. And I, I just I really do love uh, a good paper item. Um, Stephanie says, don't over plan. Now, 
this is a tip that we've talked about a thousand times. So I really loved that Stephanie brought this up. And I feel like it's something we will say until the end of this podcast. Don't over plan. Pick two or three must do things and enjoy the journey between those must do items. You miss so many things when you are in a hurry to do too much. The journey is just as important as the destination. Your travel days can be filled with just as many adventures as the destination that you're trying to get to. So I really love that Stephanie is reminding people to slow down. Plus, it always takes longer than you think it's going to take. Well, okay, here we go. Speaking of that, Keith said, for drive days over two hours, take Google's time estimate and add an extra 30 to 50 percent to estimate your arrival time. This allows for gas and lunch stops and slower driving. Perhaps it's not a secret to experienced travelers, but newbies might underestimate trip durations. We tend to add 15 minutes per every hour, and that's yeah. that really probably isn't enough. That no. really just gets us like an idea of what it should be, but that does, that's not really allowing us a little bit of freedom to stop and and enjoy like scenic overlooks and stuff well my goodness so my parents are 389 miles from where we are now Mm -hmm. and when we travel just in the truck or just in the tesla we are not pulling an rv we are doing 70 to 75 miles an hour depending on who is driving we still (laughs) we, we still need about eight hours to get there. And even though Google is telling us five hours and 45 minutes and you yeah. will be there, it is eight hours. Kids add a lot of time. Yeah. The, the more people you have, the more people are going to have to go to the bathroom. But <laughs> frankly, I can't put that on the kids though. Yeah. The, the bathroom thing is a hundred percent me. Well, I it, will be like, to an hey. extent, like we, we would be great if uh, you being the most frequent bathroom user, it would be great if everybody went when right. you go. But sometimes it's like, we just stopped it. Now somebody else needs to go. Yeah, that's happened a lot too. Even though you're saying, I really think you should go now. We yeah. stopped. And of course, at some sometimes we're just like, get out. And <laughs> you're five, going to the bathroom. Six hours <laughs> is, is not really enough time with a family of five to, to skip a meal. So we're going to stop yeah. for a meal. It was all well, that sort of stuff. Especially because we have a no eating policy in Tessie. So yeah. <laughs> there's no eating in the Tesla. Yeah. There is all the eating you want in the truck. Like the truck is free game. Yeah. You can just eat. You still got to stop for it though. So it's, you, you might too. as well stretch your legs and everything. You might right? as well. Well, getting out, walking around, that's really, really important. Okay, Tina says, people are always looking for the best app to find potential boondocking spots. However, a good starting point is Google Maps and search dispersed camping in the area you are interested in. It'll pull up BLM camping spots, forestry spots, county or city parks, fairgrounds, etc. Then you can research them more closely from there. I have never I've tried, tried this no. before. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to put this this tip to action, actually, because I have about uh, five days that I still need to figure out for our trip. And so we would like to try and do a little boondocking. I, that The kids don't know this yet. They're not going to be happy to hear this because it is going to be but July, it's going to be hot. And it's hard to find boondocking in, in the East. So I, yeah, we'll, it may we'll not, see. it may <laughs> not work out at <laughs> yeah. all. I mean, there's plenty of harvest host locations. Or we, might, already, yeah. we might find no hookup campgrounds or something like that. Oh, there's yeah. plenty of no hookup campgrounds. Yeah. If we like, I would really like to go to Cape Hatteras and there are plenty of available dry camping spots there. I just haven't really been able to commit to that and think do I want to ask everyone for three days I was looking at sort of what's the average temperature at the end of July and into August and the average temperature for that area is about 90 degrees yeah it's doable they can get in the ocean if they're hot oh boy oh boy you get to tell them that then all right (laughs) Kat says talk to the locals seriously at the gas station or grocery store or whatever, ask them what they would take guests to go see or do. Where would they eat? Is there something special about their town that people may not know? It's just such a great way to find cool stuff. I completely agree. If you are ever able to talk to a local on your travels and ask them their opinion on something, they're going to be very happy to share it with you. And that's really when you're going to find some hidden gems. 
And finally, Joanne says, we all depend on GPS or Google Maps, but I still carry a paper road atlas. There it is. It comes back around. It lets me see the big picture, whole length of trip, and is a really good reality check when the GPS tries to route you through large cities instead of around them. And we particularly recommend the Motor Carriers Atlas, which is made for truck drivers, and it tells them the the truck safe routes. Now, there are some routes that are going to be safe for you that that aren't necessarily for them um, because they have to stick to routes they're allowed on sometimes like so the motor carriers atlas isn't going to show you for instance that you can go through a national park right and if you're small maybe this doesn't matter to you but it is nice to see okay these are the routes that are generally going to be pretty much okay for me and you're also going to know that on those routes you're going to find more accessible gas stations for you because it is a truck route we always add the motor carriers atlas to our amazon store because it updates every single year for so the 2024 one is out now if you want to look at what we recommend it's just over at amazon.com slash shop slash rv miles we also have a whole bunch of other items in there that we recommend uh be that either for seasoned rvers or new ones as well all right so much more to get to on this show we're going to take a break but when we come back we're going to talk to kevin long the CEO of The Dirt, who's going to share with us some of the highlights of their most recent annual camping report. We'll be right back. We'll be right back. Chances are you've seen them on the road. That's because Blue Ox designs and manufactures the best towing products in the industry. Just look around. You'll find them on highways and campgrounds and anywhere you find people traveling in the great outdoors. Award-winning tow bars, base plates, and brakes. A full line of weight-distributing hitches. Adjustable ball mounts and a new line of fifth-wheel hitches. With Blue Ox, towing doesn't have to be a drag. To learn more about how Blue Ox can make your travel adventures even more stress-free, visit BlueOx.com. This episode is sponsored by the Park Wolf app. Ever found yourself in the heart of a national park surrounded by beauty, but unsure where to go or what to see? That's where Park Wolf comes in. Park Wolf is the ultimate app for exploring national parks. As you drive, the GPS shows you what's coming up on the road, and an audio guide will fill you in on what's there so you can decide if it's worth a stop for you or not. Gas running low, looking for a bite to eat or a bathroom break? Park Wolf's got you covered. It keeps track of the nearest gas station, restrooms, food, and pullover areas. And the best part, it works without an internet connection. And if you're a wildlife enthusiast, you'll love Park Wolf's wildlife maps and sighting notifications. So before you set off on your next national park adventure, download the Park Wolf app for your iPhone from the App Store. It's your ultimate guide to national parks. So we all know that camping has been a little bit harder over the last few years, at least in terms of finding a campsite, because camping has become a lot more popular. And the folks over at The Dirt have been tracking that over the last several years through their annual camping report. The 2024 version just came out, and we're lucky enough to have Kevin Long, the CEO of The Dirt, on the show today to chat about it. Kevin, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me, Jason. Let's begin here right at the sort of, I think, what the headline of this report is. It was four times harder to book a campsite in 2023 than it was back in 2019, pre-pandemic, back in the good old days, before everything blew. It wasn't just camping that blew up. All sort of outdoor recreation has really become very popular. But there is some good news in this report that perhaps things might be getting a little bit better. Yeah, it's actually, it's not as hard Jason, to book a campground, which is really good news. The bad news is it's still hard and it's competitive and you got to get out there and get your reservations in advance and be really smart about when you're looking for a campground. Half of the camping properties that answered in the DIRT survey said that they have expanded their properties in the last year. And you're seeing this particularly in the private space. The private RV parks are starting to add more locations and more sites within their properties, which is good. The other thing that is starting to happen, and this is really big on the dirt, uh, one of our biggest pro features on the dirt is our free camping collection, which is over 5,000 all drive-in accessible free camping spots. And that free camping, we've seen a big uptick in that as well. And I think a lot of that has to do with just technology is getting better, accessibility is getting better. We all pay taxes for this government land. Let's go use it and uh, create some lifetime experiences. So we're seeing free camping on the rise as well. 
Yeah, I think I think a lot of folks are at least willing more now to go out for a day of free camping, even if they're on a longer trip. Right? That even if it's just a a, a quick overnight somewhere, instead of having to stop at a full hookup place every time. And and a lot of the rigs are helping out with that. We've got we've got more folks with solar and lithium batteries. There's probably some extent too of the difficulty in finding campsites pushing people to find some some other options out there. Yeah, there's just so many options. I mean, just on the dirt alone, we have over 70,000 locations. We have the biggest collection of locations for camping in the U.S., along with the 12 million reviews. So being able to just, sometimes you got to take a little bit extra effort, look into some of these tools that are out there for you and leverage other campers to get that advice. You do mention in the report that the technology is one of the ways that people are finding camping a, a little bit easier, partially through the dirt. But I think we can finally maybe say that the days of calling a campground to book a reservation are nearly over. There's still a few folks out there. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised. What we've seen at the dirt is a lot of these campgrounds have like a five or a 10 year cycle where they'll then build up a campground, sell it to a next owner or build up a campground and it goes to the next generation in their family. And what's interesting with that, kind of like anything, technology is following with that, right? And so new owners are coming online to these campgrounds. They're getting savvy about like, hey, our place is full. Let's have more sites. Hey, we now have more sites. How do we fill them? Let's go get better technology and let's go get listed on all of the different apps out there for camping and all the different sites for camping so we get more eyeballs to be able to come in. And then on the flip side of that, you just have consumers who are so much more savvy. You know, in the year 2024, it's not just young people doing using technology, right? It's every single age bracket and especially when you're in a big, sophisticated RV, uh, your tech savviness jumps up pretty quick because it has to. Those are not yeah. simple little cars that you're just turning on and turning off and zipping around in. And that, what we've seen also at the Dirt, translates right over to people using smarter technology and, and smarter apps like the Dirt to find camping. So some of the challenges that people have, uh, obviously, finding a campsite that uh, at a campground that is not full. You you mentioned in the report that even first come first serve campgrounds it's twice as hard to find a first come first serve campground that isn't full. Campers are arriving at them and and, and seeing them full. But that free camping thing, let's go back to that a second because that number is huge. So you mentioned that it that you're seeing a big increase in the amount of free camping happening out there. But Two thirds of campers camped for free at least once in 2023. And that's an yep. increase from one third in 2019. So there's a couple of things that play with that. One is look at the rise of these vehicles. You now have more people in these more sophisticated vehicles. What do you have in a vehicle? You have a bathroom, you have a shower, you have a refrigerator. It is a lot easier to go do free camping. The other thing that we're seeing at the dirt is remember that free camping can also mean I'm zipping across the country and I'm staying at free and doing overnight parking, free overnight yeah. parking. So you're talking about like staying in Walmarts or Home Depots or Cracker Barrels. And that is also becoming a big thing. The average camper doesn't just go to the, the same state park they've gone to every year. They don't go to the same RV spot every year and that's all they do. What we're seeing is campers are becoming more adventurous. And they're going from state parks to private glamping spots to free overnight parking. Oh, and by the way, when they're on that road trip, they're staying overnight one night in a Walmart, right? To make yeah. that accessibility and getting there quicker. So seeing that jump every year, you're right. I mean, it's like, if you look at 2019, we had 35% of campers responding that they have done some free camping. And that number is now up to 65%, right? You're talking about two thirds wow. of campers have stayed for free at least once in 2023. It's a really big jump. Among the things that I think happens when camping gets harder to find is that we have all of these reservation windows that open up at a certain time. So if it's a state park, maybe it's yep. six months before you camp, or maybe the reservations for a park that's only open in the summer begin on January 1st or something like that. 
And along with that comes, I think, a lot of people booking sites, just a sort of maybe a wide array of sites that they hope to use, maybe they're not going to use. So we've seen, of course, a lot of people have complained about a lot of no-shows, particularly yep. at state and federal parks. So one of the really eye-opening things for me on here was that less than half of campers used all of their reservations in 2023. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't cancel in, within a decent amount of time. It says 87% canceled with more than 48 hours notice, but yeah. I thought it was really interesting to see who is no showing and, and perhaps why. Yeah. I mean, the, well, we all know why it's not that expensive. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. We all love camping because it's not that expensive. And there's that issue with reservations. It's not that expensive. I mean, how often have you just decided like, eh, I'm not going to go to that $170 hotel that I reserved and just skip it right? Yeah. You're going to call them up and you're going to beg them for that money back. That's just very different in camping. It's great that we're making camping accessible to a wide range of people with different economic levels. We want to be doing that, right? That's the point of it. It does have a little bit of a devil-edged sword, though, of people not canceling the reservations. The thing when we look at it is that frustration is real. Go around state parks and national parks. They're sold out, but they're not full. This is one of the reasons that we went really hard with the Dirt Pro and created Dirt Alerts, where you can get reservations at sold out campgrounds. You say, I want to camp at this campground on these dates, and you could either A, sit at home and push refresh on the government website with those dates, right, every minute for weeks, or you could put in a Dirt Alert, and yeah. our system will keep a watch on it, and as soon as someone cancels one of those sold out reservations, we send you a dirt alert. Hey, that campground you want on that spot just opened up. Go grab it. That has been extremely popular at the dirt. There's, I think, two levels to it. One, go put a bunch of campgrounds in months in advance, see what opens up, grab something. Or two, you got to kind of be willing to wait until right before, right, and get it. Yeah. Because that's, as you said, that's when a lot of the cancellations actually end up happening is week of. So you already mentioned that one of the one of the reasons things are getting a little bit better is that campgrounds are adding sites and half of camping properties who hosted campers in 2023 have added new sites, which is fantastic. Obviously, that growth is going to lag behind the boom in camping. So I think over the next few years, we're probably going to still see even a lot more sites. But beyond that, it's not just about more sites. It's about when these campgrounds are open. Talk about how yep. campgrounds have expanded their seasons. Yeah. So in the 2024 dirt report brought to you by the dirt and Toyota Tacoma, we have focused on a section on winter camping because we're seeing a continual growth of winter camping and camping trends that more people are starting to get out there in the winter. The dirt report this year showed that winter camping shot up 40% during the pandemic, and it's not tapered off. 84.9% camped in the fall in 2023, while 89% camped in the summer. So you're starting to see some movement in the different seasons, but the biggest one that came out of it is that one third of campers now camp during the winter months. And with private campgrounds, you're also starting to see private campgrounds, and part of this is the new generation, next generation of private campground owners who are coming on and taking it over are saying, there's demand for us to stay open longer, and they're starting to shorten those shoulder seasons when they're closed. So commercial campgrounds in particular are obviously getting a lot more expensive than they used to be. The state right. parks are also getting more expensive, but it may be lagging a bit and cheap to skip out on that reservation. But commercial campgrounds are getting expensive, right? They're getting more expensive. It is true. If you want to feel better about that, go plan a trip uh, over to Europe and <laughs> get your airline tickets and get your flights and get your meals and you still feel a lot better. Camping is still incredibly more affordable than almost any other vacation out there, and it'll continue to be so. The other thing that I found, I was actually just talking to a, a Dirt Pro user last week, and, and they, they did a, a couple that did a one-year trip around the U.S., and I asked him, how much was it? 
how much did it cost you? And, and he said they weren't going super budget or anything like that, but they ended up doing it for 2,800 a month, what ended up being their whole average, 2,800 a month. And one thing he said to me, he goes, you know, one thing we kind of avoided is we sort of avoided any of the like 150 a night campgrounds. And we would just spend a little bit extra time. And when you have time and flexibility, he's like, we found plenty of like awesome campgrounds for 40 bucks a night that work just fine, 40, 50 bucks a night. So there is still that availability, even in the big RVs to find campgrounds that aren't going to totally break the bank. Yeah, that's an excellent use for something like the dirt where you can filter out based on what you're willing to pay and you can let what is available out there guide where you might travel to, right? Exactly. And another thing to think about is cost to average it, right? So, hey, maybe on your way out to the beach, you want to stay at that really nice site. You can't quite afford the $100 a night scenario. Maybe you do three days of free camping and then three days of the hookups at the expensive place altogether it ended up costing you 75 bucks a night on average. So cost averaging by leveraging some free camping is a, is a really good way to stretch those dollars uh, this year when camping. Yeah. And it's, it's not going to end 36% of properties plan to raise their rates again in 24, which I guess isn't, it's not a ton uh, of campgrounds. I think a lot of places raise their rates every year. So maybe that is actually some positive news out there considering that 45 percent raised their rates back in in 2023 we mentioned one of the big camping trends being seasons people camping into the winter and a lot of campgrounds opening up further into the fall now let's talk about some of the other trends one of the big ones that came out of the pandemic of course was work from home work from anywhere campers worked from their campsites more than ever in 2023 right Yeah, the 2024 annual report from the Dirt and Toyota Tacoma showed that 28.9% of campers worked while camping in 2023, and that is up from 22% in 2022. So, I mean, think about that. It's almost 30% of campers are doing some work at their campsites. I think everyone's kind of life switched, right? After COVID, we started thinking about what's important. We started realizing that like, hey, I can work remotely now. If I can do a good job in my work, I can do it from anywhere. And you know where anywhere sounds like really good spot is a campground. And so we're seeing that that jump up. The the other thing I think that was a factor with it is that Wi-Fi, it's the most common amenity offered by private campgrounds. It's a you'll see it on there. We have it in the dirt app. You can filter in specifically for campground Wi-Fi. And our dirt annual report showed that 76% of private campgrounds are now offering Wi-Fi. So I think it wasn't that long ago, that was a rarity, right? To get the Wi-Fi at the campground. It was EYO (laughs) Wi-Fi. And I think we're really starting to see that change. It's getting a lot better too. You know, there was a time there where if they offered it, you couldn't count on it working at all. But it, a lot of, especially if you're paying a decent amount to stay in a place, I, I feel at least my personal experience is that the the campground Wi-Fi, when I use it, is light years beyond what it was five years ago. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and so it's just general like Wi-Fi accessibility, right? And so many more options now, and people's equipment's gotten better. You're not just relying to try to tether your phone to your yeah. computer, but it makes a big difference. And that makes a big difference for accessibility when wanting to work remotely and work from yeah. a campground. As I think that's a big factor of we're seeing the rise of that at the dirt of people working from a campground. Yeah, I think the vast majority of it too is it's not people that that yep. full-time work from home or work from the road. It's people that are planning on a seven-day vacation, but maybe I can turn that into two weeks if I can just do a few half days of work from the road or, but my whole family can go out and everything. Right. Right. Absolutely. So this is an RV podcast and RVing obviously has absolutely exploded in in the last few years. It is not the only area of camping that has exploded. Certainly all different types of camping has increased dramatically, but RV, RV market share is up 10% in 2023. Yeah. Yeah, it's made a big jump. The stats from the annual camping report from the dirt showed that the portion of campers who list RV or trailer as their primary source of camping climbed 10.9% in 2023. 
And I think some of that might be, if we go deeper into the stats, you can see that 21.8% of campers tried an RV or a trailer camping for the first time in 2023. I'd actually credit some of that to Outdoorsy and RV Share and, and a number of the other rental companies that have made it really easy to rent a vehicle and to try it before you buy it. It's a nice way to use it. Another big trend that we've seen that I've been really surprised about is you can now rent those RVs and have them delivered to the campground, use them, leave, the owner takes them away, right? So you want to try it before you buy it and you're too scared to drive it, that, that service is there as well. So I think that's helped get over those thresholds of like, hey, let's go try an RV. Hey, let's go try a trailer. And we're seeing those numbers go up. So one of the interesting things to me over the last few years too has been the, the change in the makeup of who is camping. It used to be very much thought of in, in the RV front as uh, something for retirees. I think obviously among tent campers, it's always been quite a bit broader than that. But let's talk about who is camping. Campers are increasingly diverse, right? Yeah, it's increasingly diverse and some of the economics are moving around a little bit. We see that the biggest economic household income group of campers 35% are campers with a household income of somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000. But we're seeing the second biggest group, 32%, being campers between 100,000 and 250,000. And that's an interesting jump that we've seen over the years. We're also seeing, you know, uh, increasing diversity in the from the BIPOC community and the LGBT community. We're showing over the last two years over 20 million people camp for the first time ever, right? Uh, since 2021. And I think it was just 5 million last year. And so people are getting out there for that first time, right? And some of that I think has to do also with the the growth of the uh, glamping side of things where you don't even necessarily have to have a vehicle or equipment to try it for the first time. It makes it easier to kind of jumpstart things. But we're definitely seeing increase of the bike park campers are 50% more likely um, to choose overlanding as their primary camping type. So that's been an interesting jump as well. But we're seeing 9.4% of BIPOC respondents camp for the first time in 2023. That's nearly double the rate of respondents overall. So we're interested in, in that stat. Yeah, that group of new campers seems to, over the last couple of years, match the population makeup more than it had in the past, if, if my memory serves me right. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. A, it's an interesting group of uh, that is continuing to grow. There is so much in this report that we cannot get to this whole thing in a podcast episode, but I'm going to put the, a, a link to it in the description for this episode. So if people can read through everything that, that is in here, particularly the last bit of it is a, a spotlight on West Coast camping, which I found really interesting, especially since I spent all of last year camping on the West Coast. And there's some things happening in that area that are particularly interesting. But the DIRTS 2024 camping report, it's available now. Again, I'll share it. It's sponsored by Toyota <laughs> Tacoma. And Kevin, give us a sort of a quick overview of the DIRT and what people can use it for and where to find it. Yeah, the, the DIRT is the number one ranked app in iOS and Google Play app stores. Go to those stores. You can either search the dirt or search camping. We're number one. The reason we're number one is we have the biggest database of locations, over 70,000 locations in the US. And along with that, we have the most user submitted pictures, videos, and reviews of camping, over 12 million user submitted reviews. So if you do not have the dirt app on your phone and you call yourself a camper, go grab it and download it today and you'll love it. Well, Kevin Long, CEO of The Dirt, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Jason, appreciate it. RV Miles is sponsored by eTrailer. Did you know that eTrailer.com is focused on putting actual hands on the products they sell? That allows representatives to see, touch, and know exactly what it's like to use the product, providing you with quality service and recommendations based on personal experiences. If you're looking for a one-stop shop, eTrailer.com has you covered with a variety of RV items, including towing options, interior accessories, replacement parts, storage, and more. Visit eTrailer.com slash RV miles and receive free shipping 
on orders over $99. That's eTrailer.com slash RV miles. Yes, the mattress sold in most RVs is just a placeholder so that you can buy something nicer. And yeah, in most RVs, it's an odd size. RV king or queen, they're about six inches shorter than your standard mattress. And then there's bunks, which are all over the place. And those teddy bear mattresses are nowhere near as comfortable as they might look. RVmattress.com offers real mattresses from a real mattress company, including hybrid models with actual springs in them, all conveniently vacuum packed into a box that can be delivered factory direct from their plant in Arizona to wherever you are, even at a campground. RVmattress.com offers a 120 night sleep trial. Their mattresses are toxin free. We love these mattresses. I'm not kidding. We have eight of them between our RVs and our home. Visit RVmattress.com slash RVmiles and use the code RVmiles for 25% off your order before the camping season kicks in. Our thanks to Brooklyn Bedding for supporting our channel and to you for supporting our sponsors. Welcome back to the show, and it is time to check the level of our tanks. Sponsored by Liquefied RV Toilet Treatment, the No BS Toilet Treatment. You can find Liquefied actually over in our Amazon shop. Just head over to amazon.com slash shop slash RV miles to check it out for yourself. Jay, what is in your black tank this week? Uh, something I did. Well, bo so both of my tanks come from um, our latest National Park Net News Roundup, which you can find the video version uh, on the YouTube channel, you can find the audio version over on the America's National Parks podcast stream. There was a story about Olympic National Park. You know that uh, that uh, lodge burnt down mm -hmm. in Olympic last year, and I did a story about the investigation in, into uh, how it happened, and basically it burnt down so far that they weren't able to find anything uh, about how it burnt down but the reason uh, i'm black tanking myself is because i had put a uh, an image in the video of a map of oregon instead of washington <laughs> i saw that even though last year <laughs> we spent like three weeks in the area I and just spent a lot of time in Olympic. <laughs> we did. I saw the first comment pop up about that, and I thought, no, it's, no, no, no. There's no way. It's like, the O that got me. I'm like, <laughs> Olympic National Park. And then I was because I've got this whole list of, I've got a folder of all these state map animations in yeah. our editing software. And I was like, Olympic, Oregon, because the O's, and I just uh, grabbed it, grabbed it. Well, you know, if you need an example that people are just human and everybody makes a mistake, there it is. And that's okay. It's it's okay. The information is still the same. What I loved is the person who was like, because you used Oregon, oh I just don't know if I can trust you anymore. I can't, I, I can't subscribe because I can't trust you. And I, I thought to myself, the best way you can decide whether or not this information is still accurate is to go over to Olympics website and read the press release for yourself and, and find out you... if they're still in washington maybe they <laughs> I moved i don't know <laughs> what's well, funny Listen, as i had a, a there's different always shifting happen who knows <laughs> there, there was a different story <laughs> in that episode from mount rainier in washington yeah so i had already used the the <laughs> the washington map and i could have just anyway i you know i think <laughs> There could have been a lot of ways you could have tried to spin it, yeah. you know, to justify doing it or that, but basically you're like, oops, that's on me. It's an accident. It, I, and I, you know, I apologize you for know, that. Yeah. I'm, I goofed. And I think it, it shows a lot when it's, it's hard to admit our mistakes sometimes, especially <laughs> to almost a hundred thousand of your closest friends who sometimes do feel like, um, some of them are just looking for reasons to be that's angry okay. with that's you. That's okay. They make those comments and that's engagement. And then YouTube shows it to more people. I know. I'm fine mean, with me. Look, Josh, you know, he had to, our friend Josh will actually be on the show next week. Josh, the RV nerd, you know, he's human too. And he had to walk something back and all it did was yeah. just endear him to more people, well, including us. Do we need to, to bring up back when I, I mistook <laughs> that some sandhill so cranes for Canadian geese because I didn't look up over at, at them and I just heard them flying overhead. And I'm not kidding. That video is one of our most viewed videos ever. And it has over 500 comments. Not, it has like a thousand comments. 
over 500 of those comments are people saying, that's Sand Hill Crane. I love it. I love it. Sand Hill Crane Gate. It was just the joy to continuously watch people come in as though they were sharing brand new information with you, it, even though there was a pinned comment like at the top of the video. It was and other comments. It, and was, I, it, it was so great. And we just got to the point where we were like, thank you. Thank you. It because, makes you hey, want to get something wrong on purpose. Thank you. <laughs> I, no, it does not make me want to get something wrong on purpose. Something dumb. Uh, sure, but I would prefer if people are engaging yeah. with our content because they want to engage in it in a positive way and, and not because they just want to point out flaws yeah. uh, that we all have because we're all human. All right, what is in your fresh tank this uh, week? My fresh tank is also stories from that, that video. Uh, there are two different stories about fossils in national parks. One about uh, grasshopper eggs and pods found in John Day fossil beds. First time on earth that a fossilized uh grasshopper egg pod has been found oh that's cool and and then two new species of prehistoric sharks found in mammoth cave and i just think it is so cool that our national parks are still these sort of living laboratories we think of these as places we preserve, which they are, of course, but then we're also finding things and learning things about the world in our national parks that we didn't know. And I, I just think that's a, a really wonderful thing. Wow, I should really watch this news video. Probably I should. I would have learned so much, yeah. including where Olympic National Park is. <laughs> What's in your black tank this week? So my black tank is a little bit of a gray tank. I actually think you'll be touching on it on this week's RV and Camping News video, but the state of Montana has just announced that their state parks, their reservation system, they're cutting it down to, instead of a six-month window that you can book out, it's now going to go down to a three-month window. This is one of the ways that they feel they can address uh, what seems to be overcrowding and a lot of excitement about Montana State Parks. So while I don't have an issue with them wanting to protect the state parks and make sure that these are still places of enjoyment, a three-month window can be really, really difficult for people who are trying to plan out their vacation who do not live in the state. So the window is going to go down to three months. They're also going to hold 20% of their entire camp spots to first come, first served campgrounds. So that's going to be a huge cut from what you can reserve once you hit that three month mark. And there's a few other things too. anything that you're booking for a tour and stuff like that. It's all going to go down to three months. So it's not necessarily a black tank for me because I do understand a lot of this and I don't necessarily have an issue with first come first served campgrounds. I actually, I really like that option, uh, but I do understand that this makes it a little bit difficult for people to plan now. And there's going to be more people battling for this at the three month marker. So just something to think about going forward. Uh, these will probably be changes that a lot of other state parks start to make. We're seeing every year more and more state parks kind of try to really hammer down on what's happening there. And I think this is another way to try and ward off the no shows or the last minute well, cancellation. I, I think the biggest thing from it from me was that they are reducing the um, number of days you can stay in a park too oh yes from I've, 14 down to seven i'm so glad you brought that up because yeah. i completely forgot that as well so that to me is the probably the black tank part yeah. of all of this this yeah. is why it is that the fact that now you can only stay for seven days gosh you can barely settle in yeah before you yeah. gotta go uh, the problem with that stuff, too, is like people just find ways around it to, to, you know, they'll book under one name for seven days and another for seven days. And they got to find ways to to stop that for so happening so that we can all sort of follow the same rules. Yep. What's in your fresh tank this week? So my fresh tank is some news that my mother-in-law just sent over to us, just sent to our group text. And that is at the city of Rock Island, where the Mile Zero studio is located, is considering, strongly considering putting in 200 RV spots near the marina, which yeah. is, it's just really, really exciting because we've talked a lot about this, that we really want to be able to bring the homecoming event actually here 
at some point over the next oh, several that would years. Be so cool. Sunset Marina, it, it's right on the Mississippi. Of course, it's a marina. Uh, and it, it's a really beautiful spot. You can see bald eagles there in the winter. And it, it's really easy access to where we're at at the studio here in our house and stuff. Uh, I, and of course, I, they already have some resources there because it's a, a marina. So they yeah. have staff on site and they you know deal with rentals and all that sort of stuff already in a convenience store and things like that. So I think it, it is a really no brainer, great idea to bring in some life over in that area. Yeah, I'm really excited. I hope that this isn't just uh, like smoke up my nose and well, that which, it really we don't does. often see lately it uh we haven't seen a lot of growth in the state and county yeah. uh, and local park sector you know the, there are some especially here in illinois yeah. we've not there's been no real shift at all to improve the state parks that are here or to add to them. So this is great to to see at least on the local city level that 200 RV spots, that would just be fantastic. Very excited about that. That's it for this week's episode of the RV Miles podcast. Yes, it is. And hey, we are going to be over talking a little bit more today on Detour. That's the podcast we do after this podcast for Mile Marker members. If you would like to come and listen to Jason talk solo on Detour today, he has to fly solo because I have to fly out of here. I have got to get home. I have got to get a kid to a voice lesson, and I have a whole lot to do before we fly out to Seattle tomorrow. If you would like to become a Mile Marker member, just head over to rvmiles.com slash milemarkers. It's $7 a month or $70 for a year. That's going to get you two months for free. And of course, we're in Seattle this weekend. We really hope we get to see you there. If you are in the Pacific Northwest and can make the drive, we'll be there Thursday through Sunday for the show. We would love to say hi. All right, everyone, continue to stay warm, stay healthy, and keep logging those RV miles. Bye, everybody. Bye.